Well, now, after they crossed the Jordan, they stayed at Gilgal for quite some time. They put a cairn of stones. They took 12 stones from the bed of the Jordan and made a little cairn of them at Gilgal as a reminder for future generations of how God dried up the river for them. Remembrance is a very important part of Old Testament piety. You're constantly being told to remember what the Lord had done for you. Of course, Christians are the same. We take bread and wine to do this in remembrance. We need constant reminders of what God has done for us in the past. And their favourite way was to erect cairns of stones, and especially twelve stones, one for each tribe. They also did something else. This whole new generation had not been circumcised. And so all the men of this new generation were now circumcised. It meant they had to stay in camp until their bodies recovered and they were in pain. And they were very vulnerable to attack at that time. Had the Jericho people realised, they could have marched out and really uh, walked over them at that time, but they didn't. And after a few days they were ready to go. The manna stopped as soon as they crossed the Jordan because on the other side it's very fertile. If you go to Jericho today, it's a whole oasis. The best grapefruit and oranges you'll ever taste are in Jericho. I see some of you have been. <laughs> and uh, so as soon as they got over, they had fruit and vegetables and food again. And they called the place Gilgal, which means rolled away, because God had rolled away the reproach of Egypt. They could forget Egypt now. They were in. Now, a rather strange thing happened. Joshua decided to have a personal reconnoiter of the uh, town to walk around it by himself, and he went by night. He's walking around this town when he came across an armed man. And he said, uh, whose side are you on? And the man said, no. I think that's a lovely answer. <laughs> whose side are you on? Are you on their side or ours? No. And then the personage went on to say, the important thing is whose side you are on, Joshua? Are you on God's side? And it was the captain of the Lord's host. I believe that means a senior angel, an archangel. I don't believe it was the Son of God, but I believe it was a senior archangel, captain of the Lord's host. But you're entitled to what you believe. What happened was Joshua was being reminded that he is not the highest officer in the Lord's army, <laughs> that he's an under-officer. It's a gentle little reminder. So they set about conquering the land. And uh, as I've told you, they drove a wedge in the center first and then cleaned up the south and then cleaned up the north. Brilliant strategy. Now there's more space given to the first two towns than any others later. That's because the first two towns were terribly significant. One positively and the other negatively. One was a complete victory and the other was a disaster. Jericho was the victory. Now Jericho is still there. Even ancient Jericho, though modern Jericho is a mile down the road. Now here are some rather poor photographs but this is looking across the Jordan Valley to the hills of Moab beyond. The Jordan is running there. Here's the oasis of uh, Jericho. And in the middle of it is this heap of rubble. It towers above everything else. It's just a big heap of dust, apparently. It's what we call a tell. Now, the word tell simply means the ruins of a city or at least of many cities that have been built on top of each other. As a city was destroyed, so they built another on the top of it. So gradually a man-made hill emerges. You may have noticed in some old villages in England that the front doors of the cottages are way below the street level. That's because the street has been built up and up and up on top of itself. And a tell is formed that way. And so archaeologists one method is to take one layer off and then the next and then the next, but that destroys each layer as they go down. Another method is to take a slice right out of the middle and see it like a sandwich cake and then notice the particular pottery in each layer and date it and so on. That's what they've done with this mound. It's just this long mound here. Looking down on it from the air, 
This is what you would see. Here are all the fruit trees of the Jericho Oasis. But here is the old, Old Testament city. Nobody's living in it now. It's just a heap of rubble and ruin, as you can see. But they've actually uh, cut a trench right across the middle there and unearthed the oldest building in the world, which I'll show you in a moment. They have discovered that Jericho is actually the oldest city in the whole world, to our knowledge. It actually dates from 8000 BC. And in fact, there is one building in it, which I'll show you now, a round tower with a spiral staircase inside it. You can't go down, they've had to put a grid over it because it was people were wearing the stones away, but this round fortification is 8,000 BC. It's 10,000 years old you're looking at, and that is the oldest building in the world, and they found that by digging this trench right through the middle. They've also found a lot of uh, features of the city, and one unusual feature is that it had double walls, two walls. The outer wall and then a 15-foot gap, and then the inner wall. The outer wall was six feet thick and made of rock, and the inner wall was 12 feet thick and made of brick. Now, this is the kind of problem that the Israelites faced. That's a mighty big fortification. But something had happened. So let's uh, take those pictures away and look at Jericho. That's a very oversimplified cross-section of uh, the tell, and you can see how the different ages of cities have been built on top of each other. There's not much of Joshua's city left, just a little bit here. That's the late bronze city, the time of Joshua. The main road that you drive along is here, the bus will take you alongside this mound of dirt, and the spring which supplies all the water for Jericho is just alongside it, lovely fresh water, but if you remember in Elisha's day, that spring became radioactive and uh, had to be cured with a miracle again. But here we have the different cities, the Neolithic city, the pre-pottery age, then the early, the Neolithic pottery age, then the early bronze, the late bronze, just that little bit, Iron Age, and finally bits that are later, but now it's just a rough, dusty thing. And they found various bits of wall here, that's where they found the double wall. Um, now then, because of that wall, Jericho was very limited in size, but the population grew. So what did they do? They decided to build houses over the two walls bridging them actually, just to find more space. So it was a very crowded little city with houses actually sitting on top of the six-foot wall, then the gap, and then the 12-foot wall. The walls were about 30 feet high. Now bear in mind that it was already on these layers of previous cities. Can you see that the walls, with the extra weight of houses on top of them, are not very strong? Can you see that? Again, I'm not trying to explain the miracle, I'm trying to show you the situation as it was. A slight earth tremor would bring the whole lot down. Whether it was an earth tremor that God used to do that or not, we don't know. It could even have been quite feasible that in fact a loud sustained noise would have done that. And it's very interesting that God told them to blow these horns that I've just blown here, and it says, immediately when the horns blew, the, the walls came down. You know that some singers can bust a light bulb if they get the right note. It may well be that God knew that those walls were already precariously balanced on these slopes and had the extra weight of houses just asking for a collapse. Whatever, I don't know. The fact is that God said, you march round it seven times, once a day, in total silence, and on the eighth day, you blow. And they blew these horns, which I've been trying to blow all night. Or whatever. 
and you can imagine all those horns blowing on the same note, and the people shouted as loud as they could. And after six days' silence, <laughs> I should think that was pretty unnerving for the inhabitants anyway, but the walls collapsed, and the houses on them, except for one. Because you remember the prostitute Rahav, her house was on the walls. So God saved one bit of wall, <laughs> and the scarlet thread out of the window saved her life and her family. And that's how she became the great-great-grandmother, sorry, the great-great-great-grandmother of King David, and the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother of Jesus himself. And put in the genealogy in Matthew 1, it's an amazing story. Well, they didn't even have street fighting, they just walked into the city and took it. But God said, this city is the first fruits, it's mine. You don't touch a thing in it. And in that way, God told them, the victory was mine, not yours. You don't deserve anything from this city, this is my victory. You can conquer the other cities, and you can loot the other cities, but you're not to loot this one. And we know that a man did. Because the next place they went to was a place called Ai, further up the hill. That's all that's left of Ai, that's the best photograph I could get of Ai, it's just a heap of ruins. But it was a flourishing city. And they made two errors, two blunders. Number one, overconfidence. And Joshua said, we don't need many troops for this one. It's easy conquering this land. How fatal it is to think that because God has blessed you once, he's going to do it again, or because you've had a success in one sphere, that that will be repeated. So often, when I've been at an occasion where God has really been present and blessed us, the immediate reaction of people afterwards, we must do this again. And I've said, no, you must not do this again. Because you're thinking, go out and do it as you did before. That's what Samson said, I'll, I'll go out as before. You can't repeat God. And they were overconfident and thought that only a few troops would get AI. More than that, a man called Achan had stolen something from Jericho. He saw some nice clothes and he thought, well, they're no use to God, but I could make use of them. And he saw some gold as well and he took it. Now, when Joshua's troops first attacked Ai, they were routed and they fled. And Joshua came back to God and said, God, why have you let that happen? Now the word will go around the whole country. We are not invincible. We're finished. And he blamed God for it. And God said, Joshua, it could be your fault, you know. Find out who took the forbidden thing in Jericho. And that's when they called the tribes together Again, they used lottery, and by lot they settled on this tribe. Then they got the different clans together, and by lot they settled on this clan. Then they got each family in the clan together, and by lot they found the family of Achan. Now, why did lots work in the Old Testament? The answer is very simple. They believed that, that God was in control of any, every situation. And that when, just for sake of argument, when they tossed a coin, God could catch it and turn it the right number of times to tell them what he wanted. That's the theory. Theologically, it's thoroughly sound. If God can pull walls down of Jericho, he can certainly determine lots. And they used lots deliberately so that man had no influence in this situation. Now, we do that as well. We toss a coin for who goes into bat first at a cricket match. That's to stop any person choosing. But the difference is that when they cast lots, they believe it allowed God to choose because he could control the lot. And that's why they did it right up to the day of Pentecost. After that, God's Spirit guided them. So we don't need to toss coins now. We've got the Spirit to guide us. But in the Old Testament days, that's what they did. The priest carried two stones inside his breastplate, a black and a white stone. 
and they were called the Arim and the Tumin, and one meant yes and one meant no. And they would go to the priest and say, does God want me to marry this girl or not? And the priest would close his eyes and pull out a stone. If it was a black stone, the answer was no, and if it was a white stone, the answer was yes. I wish we could have guidance that way now. It, it, it would be very much simpler and easier just to go to the pastor and say, pick a stone for me, and then you know what to do. Actually, God wants a more personal relationship with us than that. He wants to work it out much more personally. But that was the way they did it. And we shall see that's how they divided the land later. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Achan. As later, the sailors on a ship heading for Spain cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. You find this again and again, that God controls the lot. He doesn't control the national lottery in our country. But he does control the lot in the Old Testament, and that's important. So, Ai was a disaster, and Achan and his family had to die. They clearly knew what he'd done, and they welcomed it. They were glad to have the clothes and the gold. But one man's sin caused the people of God to fail. It's almost frightening, isn't it, that one member of a church could have the same effect. When there's sin in the camp, you can't sin to yourself. It can affect everybody else and the people of God. Well, finally they reached Mount Ebal and they obeyed Moses. Moses said, when you get to the mountain in the center, there are two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim. He said, you're to stand on both mountains, some of you, and, and on one mountain you shout the blessings and on the other mountain you shout the curses. And if you go to those two hills today, they're just near Shechem, and there's a kind of amphitheater. Both hills are hollow on the face towards each other. So can you imagine a huge two new natural amphitheaters? You can hear perfectly right across the valley. And there they stood and they shouted the blessings and the curses and a reminder of the covenant. Then they went on to the south. <coughs> I want to go back to the outline. I don't know what I've done with it. Yes, I do. They cleaned up the south and that's when the sun stood still. They were attacked by five Amorite kings led by the king of Jerusalem, a man who called himself Lord Righteous. Isn't that interesting? Because Jerusalem was still in enemy hands and he led five kings to attack them in the valley of Ayalon. Here's a photograph out of a book, as you can see, of the valley of Ayalon with the sun. That's the place where it happened, where the sun stood still. Now, what do we make of that? I'm going to read you something written by Mr. Harold Hill, the president of the Curtis Engine Company of the United States, a consultant in the American space program. I think one of the most amazing things that God has for us today happened recently to our astronauts and space scientists at Greenbelt, Indiana. They were checking the position of the sun, moon and planets out in space, where they would be a hundred years and a thousand years from now. We have to know this in order that we don't send up a satellite and it collides with something later on on one of its orbits. We have to lay out the orbit in terms of the life of the satellite and where the planets will be so that the whole thing will not go wrong. They ran the computer measurements backwards and forwards over the centuries and it came to a halt. The computer stopped and put up a red signal which meant that there was something wrong either with the information fed into it or with the results as compared with the standards. They called in the service department to check it out and they said it's perfect. The head of the operation said, what's wrong? Well, we found there's a day missing in space in elapsed time. They were puzzled and there seemed no answer. Then one man on the team remembered he'd been told at Sunday school of the sun standing still. They didn't believe him. But as no alternative was forthcoming, they asked him to get a Bible and find it, which he did in the book of Joshua, chapter 10. The spacemen said, there's the missing day. Well, they checked the computers going back into the time it was written and found it was close, but not close enough. The elapsed time that was missing back in Joshua's day was 23 hours and 20 minutes, not a whole day. They read the Bible again, and then it said in Joshua, about a day. 
these little words in the Bible are important, but they were still in trouble because if you can't account for 40 minutes, you will be in trouble a hundred years from now. 40 minutes had to be found because it can be multiplied many times over in orbits. Then it was this same man remembered somewhere in the Bible, it said that the sun went backwards and the spacemen told him he was out of his mind, but they got out the Bible and found how Hezekiah on his deathbed was visited by the prophet Isaiah who told him that he was not going to die. And Hezekiah asked for a sign. And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken, and the shadow shall go forward ten degrees or go back ten degrees. And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backward ten degrees. And Isaiah cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward, by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. Ten degrees is exactly forty minutes. So 23 hours and 20 minutes in Joshua plus 40 minutes in 2 Kings make the missing 24 hours, which they had to log in the logbook as being the missing day in the universe. Make of that what you will. That's where it happened. At this point, they began to divide the land and they did it with a national lottery so that there would be no human influence on the choice. And uh, Joshua sent out surveyors and they came back with a complete survey of the land. Um, there's a little map here that might uh, just show you. It's a uh, fascinating little land, it's only the size of Wales. Uh, it has it's the only green bit in the Middle East. The Arabian Desert is this side and the Negev Desert south. Uh, the rain comes from the Mediterranean and drops on these hills first and then on the hills over the Rift Valley. That's all it is, that's the Promised Land. But it was divided up, surveyed, and they gave by lot the portion to the tribes. Two and a half tribes wanted this part of the land over the other side of the Jordan, in Transjordan as we call it today. And so Moses had made them promise that they could have that land provided they came and helped their other tribes to conquer this side. And if they helped their brethren to get this land, they could then go back and settle that way. So that's what happened. Two and a half tribes settled here and the other nine and a half, or ten and a half, no, nine and a half, settled on this side and the land was divided and everybody was happy with the division. That occupies quite a few chapters in Joshua. There were, of course, special cities. There had to be six cities of refuge, three either side of the Jordan, where people guilty of manslaughter could flee and not be uh, killed for having murdered. And there were also cities for the Levites. It's all there in the book of Joshua. So we come to the last two chapters, the final epilogue where he preaches this magnificent sermon. There are just two things I want to say about this. He's an old man, he's 120, called at the same age as Moses, 80, but now he knows he's going to die. It's amazing how many people in the Bible know when they come to die. And even Christianity, you know, is a way of death as well as a way of life. As a man in Beaconsfield wrote to all his relatives when the doctor told him he'd reached the end of the road, and he said, come and stay with me, come and see how a Christian dies. What a challenge. So the Great men of God, when their time comes, they know they're going and they usually leave behind a message for which they'll be remembered. The first thing we notice is the office of leadership. Joshua did not appoint a successor. Moses did. Joshua didn't. Why not? Because from now on, one man couldn't handle. The people were scattered. One man would be inaccessible to many of the tribes. From now on, each tribe had to have its own elders. That's a very significant move. It actually failed and the people wanted one man leadership again and demanded a king. But it was not God's will. God's will was that elders in each tribe should take over the leadership because that means that people have immediate access to the elders and that's a very important principle. Once you build a hierarchy with a man at the top, he becomes inaccessible. And uh, it's very important that the will of God for his people was local elders in immediate contact with the local people. 
but they didn't accept that and it didn't work. But that was God's will. So he reminded them of the covenant and he reminded them that God had promised not only to bless but to curse. And he promised both. And he said, God always keeps his promises. He brought us into this land, but he won't stop dealing with us now. Interesting that Joshua gave all the credit for getting the land to God. Took no credit himself, though he'd led them. He said, God brought us in. God fought for us. God gave us this land. God did it. And you should be jolly grateful to him. So he made them take an oath of loyalty to God. And in chapter 24, a unique thing happens. He speaks in the first person singular as he does in chapter 23. But in chapter 24, I means God. He is now prophesying. And his last message was prophecy from beginning to end. And though he still says I, whereas in chapter 23, I means Joshua, whereas in chapter 24, I means Yahweh, always the God of hosts. And this is what God says through Joshua. He says, I have done all this for you. And there's just one statement of God's that I love. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build, and you live in them, and you eat from vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. You didn't, but I gave them to you. I've given you all this. And now, out of gratitude, Joshua speaks again in his own name. So fear the Lord and serve him and be faithful to him and throw away all other gods. That's when he makes that magnificent statement. As for me and my family, we serve the Lord. Now he said, that's the choice. You've got the land. Whose God is going to be your God now, now that you've got what you want? Very significant challenge. And they said, we will serve the Lord. So he said, right, I'm going to put that on a stone here. And he set up a stone of witness. Three times they said, we will serve the Lord. The last few verses are three burials. The burial of Joshua, the burial of Joseph's bones. Do you know, all the way for 40 years they'd carried a coffin out of Egypt. As well as everything else, they actually carried a coffin all that way with Joseph's bones in it because his dying wish was, bury me in the promised land. And now at last, they bury Joshua, they bury Joseph's bones, and they bury Eliadza, the son of Aaron. So there's a triple funeral that rounds off this book. And it says this, that as long as Joshua and his generation of leaders lived, the people were faithful to God. But when the next generation came, things went badly wrong. One of the biggest problems is passing the faith on to the next generation. It really is for a second generation of Christians' children to be as enthusiastic as their, conver their converted parents who first came to the Lord. It's not easy. And it's uh, a problem that has followed the Christian church for a long time. Each generation has to rediscover God for themselves. And though they may hear what God did for their parents and grandparents, that doesn't make the children go. So let's summarize what we learn from Joshua. As I read Joshua, these are the lessons I learn. I can sum it up in two simple sentences. Without him, they couldn't have done it. But without them, he wouldn't have done it. Now those are the two very important lessons. There's a balance here. It's so easy to go overboard and put all the responsibility on God or to put it all on us. But there is a biblical balance. Without God, we can't do it. But without us, he won't do it. Notice the change of verb. It's not without us, he can't. It's without us, he won't. 
And this is the beautiful balance that goes all the way through the Bible. With God all things are possible. Without him he chooses not to work with us. He needs us. He wants us. We are called to be co-workers with God. If Joshua and the people of Israel hadn't cooperated with God, it wouldn't have happened. And yet without him and without his intervention, they couldn't possibly have done it. Now that's the beautiful balance. So, first of all, we see a lot of divine intervention in the book of Joshua. We see God's words and we see his deeds. He makes his promises and he keeps them. He made a solemn covenant which he never broke. Not for one minute did God go back on his word. He had sworn by himself, by myself, by God, I'll stay with you. If it means punishing you, I'll punish you. And blessing you, I'll bless you, but I'm going to stay with you. It's for better or worse, for richer or for poorer. I'm your God. God cannot tell a lie. I once made a list of things God can't do. Because, you know, when you think of God Almighty, you think he can do anything. No, he can't. There are many things God can't do. And the first thing I wrote down was God can't tell a lie. And I finished up with a list of 31 things that God can't do. And with a shock, I realized that I could do every one of them. Does that make me greater than God? No. Thank God there are some things he cannot do. I'll tell you one thing he can't do, he can't change the past. Once it's happened, even God cannot change it. He can change its effect and its result, but he can't change the event. So God himself can't undo the cross. It's happened. God cannot tell a lie. He cannot break a promise. He just can't. It's against his whole nature. He couldn't promise you something and then not do it. That's God. I think the things he can't do are as wonderful as the things he can do. And he cannot break his word. Now, we've broken our promises, I'm sure. But he can't. It's against his whole character. He cannot make a promise to Israel and then go back on it. Thank God for that. It says, God gave to Israel all the land he promised to their fathers. He did it. And his deeds, he says at the beginning of Joshua, I will fight for you and I will drive them out. I'll do it. That's the meaning of the word Emmanuel. Now I'm going to give you four possible meanings of that word and I want you to vote on it, which you think is right. Meaning number one, God is with us. Meaning number two, God is with us. <coughs> meaning number three, God is with us. And meaning number four, God is with us. Now it only means one of those four things. Let's take a quick vote. God is with us. How many? God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. Well, that's pretty evenly divided, but um, the fourth was right. The fourth was right. Emmanuel means God is on our side. The emphasis is he's going to fight for us, not them. So the emphasis is on us. God is with us. And Emmanuel sums up the God who said to Joshua, I'll fight for you. I'm on your side. If you're on my side. And so we have the division of the Jordan River, the collapse of Jericho's walls, the cessation of the manna, another battle which they won because of an almighty hailstone, the lengthening of the day in the valley of Ayalon. Another time God sent hornets. And even while the enemy were marching towards them, these hornets came. Now, if you can imagine a swarm of hornets, I tell you, you don't stay and fight. You run. And that's how they won one of the biggest battles, just through hornets. See, God controls the insect world again. And all this was his doing and it was marvelous in their eyes. But the other side is equally important. God does it through human cooperation. He didn't fight by himself. They had to be in the battlefield. They had to go. And God fought for them. Now this is the balance. Some people just say, oh, well, leave it to God. He'll do it all. Other people talk as if they can do it all. And you find both sorts of Christians. But the balanced Christians 
pray as if it all depends on God and work as if it all depends on them. <laughs> There's a kind of beautiful balance in the Bible here. Without them, he wouldn't have done it. They had to go in and he said, every bit of land you stand on, I'll give it to you. But you've got to go and stand on it. So without them, he wouldn't have done it. Their attitude, if their attitude remained one of confidence and their action one of obedience, they would win every battle. But if their attitude became self-confidence and their action became disobedience, they'd lose every battle. And that's why, though the book of Joshua covers 40 years, the two major parts of it are the story of Jericho and the story of Ai. If you learn the lessons of those two towns, then you're set for the conquest of the land. Interesting, isn't it? Well, the Bible, as I've said earlier, is a very honest book, and it says they did make three mistakes, only three, when they took the land. The first was at Ai. They were defeated by superior troops because they had too much self-confidence. The second I haven't mentioned was where one of the tribes already in the land tricked them and they tore their coats and they put on old shoes and they blackened their faces and they came to the Israelites and they said, we've come from a distant land because we've heard God is with you. Look at our clothes, look at our shoes. We've walked hundreds of miles because we hear about your God. They'd only come from around the corner. And because they put on this show, it says Joshua didn't ask the Lord about them. And he was fooled. And he made a peace treaty with them. A devastating thing to do. And only then discovered that they were just living around the corner. And this was their way of escaping defeat. And they didn't ask God about it, so they were tricked. And the third time was when the two and a half tribes that were going to live on the far side of the Jordan finally went off to claim their territory. And when they crossed the Jordan, they put up a cairn of stones. And the tribes on this side of the Jordan said, hey, they've built an altar, so they're not going to be part of us. And misunderstanding arose among God's people. And they said to them, we're going to fight you. And they gathered an army to go and defeat the two and a half tribes. Internal misunderstanding. And the two and a half tribes said, no, no, we, we've done that to remind our children and our children's children that we came from your side of the Jordan and that we belong with you. And the misunderstanding was removed and peace came back. So even among the people of God, there can be misunderstanding when you don't ask God about things. Well, what's the Christian application of Joshua? Very simple, in the New Testament, Joshua is used as an example of faith. Rahab the prostitute is an example of faith again and again. Achan is used as an example of sin in the people of God. And their corresponding uh, event in the New Testament is Ananias and Sapphira which exactly corresponds to the sin of Achan in the old people of God. Do you remember the couple? And then, of course, it's used for salvation because, in fact, Joshua's name means salvation. It was originally Hoshea, but Moses changed it to Yoshua, which is the same as Jesus, and means God saves. When my wife and I moved to the village where we live, the postmaster was called Mr. God Save. And it was delightful going to visit Mr. God Save the Postman. But actually, in Hebrew, he would be Mr. Yoshua or Mr. Jesus, Mr. God Save. And finally, what is the promised land for the Christian that we're to be brought into? Not heaven. When you sang, When I Tread the Verge of Jordan, I wonder what you were thinking about. Were you thinking about death? Because the promised land for us is not heaven. The promised land is holiness because the promised land is rest from battle. It's the promised land of victory when you've won the battle and you can enjoy what God has for you. And of course, whenever you overcome a temptation, you have a little foretaste of the rest, don't you? You've won the battle and there's a rest from the, from the conflict 
There remains a Sabbath rest, says Hebrews 4, for the people of God. Joshua didn't get people into that rest. And there remains a Sabbath rest for us to get into. And it's to cease from our own works. It's to take a holiday from yourself and rest. Actually, most holidays we take ourselves away with us. And that's not rest, is it? But to take a holiday from yourself and cease from your own works is to enter into the promised land of God's rest and enjoy his victorious life. The best book on Joshua I've ever read is Alan Redpath's little book, Victorious Christian Living. Do get that book. It's how the book of Joshua enables Christians to enter into their promised land of rest from battle. Amen. <laughs>